Okay. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present on behalf of our UC Santa Cruz and Buck Institute GDAC, and I'm also presenting on behalf of the first author of this study, a uh, scientist in my group by the name of Christina Yao, who couldn't attend. <clears throat> Clinical um, breast cancer physicians actually have been long subsetting breast cancer, phenotyping it by virtue of the receptors, the estrogen and progesterone receptor denoted as um, HR here, and or in tumors that uh, are HR negative, either as triple negative or HER2 positive. And we do this for predictive reasons because we have targeted therapeutics that treat uh, patients that are HR positive or HER2 positive, but we only have empiric chemotherapy to treat those that are HR negative. Well, since the uh, seminal work of Sorley, per, uh, Peru, and colleagues um, in 2001 who took the transcriptome of breast cancers and came up with intrinsic subtypes, as you see the five different subtypes here, uh, <clears throat> we see the importance of this is that it's prognostic that we have two estrogen receptor positive groups um, that are in the luminal A and luminal B categories that have very different outcomes. Uh, luminal A has a very good outcome as shown by the top Kaplan-Meier curve. Luminal B, the poor outcome, HER2 positive and basal poor outcome as well. But clinicians do not use this because it still requires um, <clears throat> fresh or fresh frozen tissues to do a microarray or RNA-seq type studies to do this intrinsic classification. So, the biological and clinical heterogeneity of breast cancer in, is most evident by these transcriptome analyses and the intrinsic subtypes, and with a 50-gene classifier, we can now do this, uh, known as the PAM-50. And in fact, the TCGA data is now annotated both for the clinical subtypes, the receptors, as well as the PAM-50 calls of these five intrinsic types. Um, <clears throat> With the exception of the HER2 subtype, however, the pathways and signaling properties uh, drive the other three major subtypes are really still unknown. These are the basaloid, the luminal A and B. Of course, we know luminal A and B have estrogen receptor, but we don't know why the outcome is so very different between those two. So <clears throat> we wanted to uh, search for pathway differences that might be able to uh, discriminate between these in three, three intrinsic subtypes and we employed the pathway inference tool that you've heard about this morning and yesterday known as Paradigm. This obviously integrates DNA copy number and transcriptome data onto, uh, onto uh, over 500, in fact, 508 TCGA breast cancer samples um, <clears throat> that I'm gonna describe here. Now, uh, Josh is giving you a very good overview of Paradigm and also the novel applications of this. We're using the most recent version that's actually now present in Firehose. It's a super pathway, it's curated uh, 1,300 different pathways uh, with about 16,000 different uh, features. Features represent either proteins, protein complexes, or cell outcomes such as uh, G2M transition or ribosome biogenesis. <clears throat> and <clears throat> you get a, then a heat map, as Josh pointed out before, where the samples are on the bottom, the pathway features are on uh, uh, the vertical, and you can see the clustering of uh, pathway activities into p potential networks. Sorry. So our workflow is shown here. Uh, using the copy number changes and the expression data, and we then use the uh, inferred pathway activities derived from paradigm. We use some minimum activity filters uh, to generate from the um, 16,000 down to 12,000 uh, varying activities. Um, we then uh, used um, consensus clustering to identify um, uh, inherent clusters within the path inferred pathway activities, and we compared these to the intrinsic subtype calls from the PAM50. We used both parametric and non-parametric analyses in the ANOVA or Kruskal-Wallace to uh, look for differences in the pairwise comparisons. And then <clears throat> in the differentially expressed uh, pathway features, we use both pathway enrichment and uh, subnetwork analysis of the super pathway where we look for 10 or more edges. What you see here is the cluster analysis of the four different uh, feature pathways, uh, the inferred pathway activities. There's actually three major ones. There's one very small one here, which I'm going to ignore because of its size, but did come out in, in every uh, 
significance test. So pathway one, however, you see in this light blue one, um, and you see now the clinical annotations for HER2 estrogen receptor status and the PAM50 calls. What's obviously in, in the HER2 in the estrogen receptor, uh, where its negative is dark purple, you see all the ER negative tumors are over on the left side in this dark blue, and you see that the HER2 positive tumors are scattered throughout, and you, <clears throat> and you see um, as well that the PAM50 calls are enriched so that this uh, cluster three down here is uh, largely basal, uh, cluster two here is a largely luminal B, and cluster one there is largely luminal A. And, oops, Keep pushing the wrong button. So the enrichment is shown here in these diagrams. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> when I show you the entire heat map, again, with those enriched activities present, we can annotate the heat map and show uh, genes that are semic repressed as well as those that are semic activated uh, of interest. The CMIC repressed and activated ones are, indicate that CMIC levels are very low in this cluster one, which is the luminal A. And in fact, in exa two examples of the CMIC re repressed genes uh, that are elevated in luminal A represent uh, the two microRNAs, 146 and LET7, which actually serve to downregulate invasion and growth pathways in breast cancer, and these have been well validated. FOXA1 and estrogen receptor activities are seen to be strong in the two luminals and absent in the basal or the cluster 3. And you see the HIF1 alpha and integrins are strong in the basal or cluster 3. <clears throat> As well, co-associating with MYC and FOXM1 uh, are aurora kinase B and polokinase 3. Uh, genes you've heard about before, but these are actual pathways associated uh, or hubs associated with these pathways that are higher in the uh, cluster 3 or basal-like. So and there's the enrichment shown in those three clusters. When we did pathway enrichment uh, by E-score, we actually found uh, common differences that were shared by the luminal A and B that differentiated them from the basal-like breast cancer. And whereas the um, heat map had indicated FOXA1 and estrogen receptor and HIF1-alpha as being higher in the basals and different from both luminal subtypes, uh, the pathway enrichment score also identified gleam-mediated hedgehog, hedgehog signaling and HDAC signaling 1, um, which are differentially uh, represented between these luminal and basal subtypes. Now, when we specifically look at a, a luminal versus a basal, I'm going to show you luminal A versus basal, but the virtually identical with some minor changes between, when I look at luminal B versus basal, you see a strong enrichment, and in other words, um, blue activity is higher in luminal A, red activity is lower in luminal A or high <clears throat> higher in basal. You see that the HIF1-alpha or aryl hydrocarbon uh, nuclear translocator hub is very high in uh, basal and you see the estrogen receptor as you would expect and um, its complex and interaction with FOXA1 is very high in the luminal. When we look at luminal A versus luminal B, a very interesting division because we know that the outcomes are very different, at least historically, uh, but we don't really understand the mechanistic differences. We see that the luminal Bs are very rich in, uh, in activities with MIC-MAX complex as well as the MIB complex. In addition, if we look at the luminal A versus luminal B, we also see FOXM1 and pololite kinase one activities are enriched in the luminal B. So what was interesting from the TCGA data that confirmed um, historical data and probably is the only uh, evidence of survival differences that we've seen so far in, in the 508 breast cancers from the TCGA is the significant difference between luminal A and luminal B in the outcome. Now these cases would be uh, uniformly treated with a hormonal therapy, so I, and that's the most effective therapy in these two subtypes, so I think these are real significant differences. Uh, what we look to see is whether or not the activity hubs that we found differentiating luminal A and B could also be used to uh, 
distinguish overall survival, and in fact, they could, as you see here. The high mic max complex uh, is associated uh, when you lump luminal A's and B's together with worse outcome. High FOXM1 is also associated with worse outcome when you lump them together and you look at the composition of the green and red survival curves, they're actually mixed with regard to luminal A and B status. We didn't have enough cases in order to do a multivariate analysis that showed any significance for luminal status versus MIC MAC versus Fox M1. <clears throat> but it looks like the Fox M1 and the MIC MACs actually represent reasonable surrogates to differentiate survival between um, the luminal subsets. So, in conclusion, We've used unsupervised consensus clustering based on paradigm features, inferred path pathway activities, uh, showing significant uh, associations and enrichments with the intrinsic breast cancer subtypes. And pairwise comparisons between the intrinsic breast cancer subtypes identified FOXA1 estrogen receptor and lower HIF1-alpha pathway activities as being shared in the luminal versus the basal, or you could say the other way around, the basals have low FOXA1 ER and high HIF1 alpha ARNT relative to the luminals. This pathway activity also identified MIC-MAX, FOXM1, MIB, and pololite kinase 1 as network hubs with elevated activities in the luminal B versus the luminal A. Two of these show comparable prognostic value and survival associations uh, in luminal uh, as we see with luminal status. And this super pathway analysis may therefore help to identify some pathways and signaling features between clinical intrinsic breast cancer subtypes and ultimately point to subtype specific therapeutic strategies. I would point out that there are clinical studies in progress with pololite kinase 1 uh, inhibitors. Um, as well, there are newly identified chemical entities that are quite specific for FOXM1. So these would be uh, strategies that one might pursue to try to get a handle on the treatment of this poor outcome luminal B type subset. As well, we have therapies that can at attack the um, angiogenic, uh, hypoxic, and <clears throat> uh, oxidative stress associated network that seems to be coming up in the basal like breast cancers. So I want to thank you for your attention and acknowledge the, uh, the uh, UC Santa Cruz team as well as my uh, Buck co-investigators, our breast analysis working group led by Chuck Peru and the entire organization here for everything that's uh, allowed us to do this very comprehensive analysis. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Benz. Very nice presentation. Um, question, the luminal Bs, are they all hormone receptor positive and HER2 positive, or are there subsets within there that might have something to do with the progesterone receptor and or proliferation? Probably not with regard to progesterone receptor, but probably, I mean, definitely with regard to proliferation. In fact, the uh, pathologic poor surrogate for a luminal B intrinsic subtyping is KI67, and we, and clinically, the clinicians will use a KI67 value of over 11 or 12 percent to designate a potential luminal B or poor outcome patient. But um, uh, what I'd like to point out is that based on this analysis, I don't think proliferation is the only thing that's really being driven in this pathway. Um, you know, so I, I I think that uh, we need more clues as to, to get handles on, on how to therapeutically attack this subset of, of tumors. Uh, I had one. Uh, so there's been some discussion in the literature about uh, autophagy and its um, linkage to uh, poor prognosis in breast cancer. Uh, I was wondering whether in your analyses, you uh, saw any evidence of, of autophagy genes? Well, it, it didn't come out as a feature, um, but I will say that our analysis was filtered so that we, we looked for uh, features that had uh, 10 or more interconnections. So uh, some of the things in, in the super pathway that are out, perhaps not as well annotated pathways, um, you know, may still reveal these kinds of things. And uh, obviously, as you heard this morning, paradigms are sort of a work in progress. Um, and at this present time, you know, has 
um, about 1,300 different curated pathways involved in it, but that's uh, growing. So hopefully um, we'll get more answers of, like that. Okay, good. Thanks very much. Uh, please join me in thanking the organizers and the speakers for the morning session. Uh, coffee break, I think. <laughs>